Hi everyone. Um, we have our interview with Jason Gautier today from Street Cuts Barber. So I'm just going to invite him into our interview. For those of you that don't know, Street Cuts Barber is a nonprofit organization that provides free haircuts to individuals that are less fortunate. So, hi Jay, how are you doing? Good, how are you, Catherine? Good, sorry about the time zone mix up. You know, we live in Saskatchewan and I always get it mixed up anyways, it's all good. Okay, yeah, no, honestly, I feel like every time we do one of these interviews, there's always something new, you know? There is, even with like, even any interview I've had, it's always something, so don't worry yeah. about it. So is your last name, is it Gauthier? Is that the right way to pronounce it? It's Jason Gauthier, yeah. Gauthier, okay. Yeah. I'm not sure about that. So is it cold in Moose Jaw also? Because here in Alberta, we're freezing. <laughs> it is minus 40 here. Oh, I think you're colder where you yeah. are, actually. <laughs> yeah, it's freezing here. It's like uh, Elias, my son, I'm a full-time dad, and he didn't even go to school today. It was too cold, so. Yeah. Well, yeah. <laughs> you guys are staying warm then um, at home. So the first question I had for you, so you've done a lot of different things in your life. How come you decided to become a barber and to start Street Cuts Barber? So I was working front-end mental health um, in Vancouver, and I did that for about 15 years. I worked counseling, front-end mental health, homeless shelters, and I really had a passion for hair starting in about 2008, but I was kind of, I felt I was bound to being a counselor because I come from the prison system and I come from the homeless system and I, I felt like I needed to give back. And it was my way of healing, giving back and making some kind of money at it. But what ended up happening is when I was in Vancouver, fentanyl, the, the crisis hit us really bad and people were overdosing every day. And that's all we were doing. It was just going from one overdose to the next. And I was burying my clients more than I was helping them. Yeah. And it was starting to really get to me. And I didn't know how to get out because I was in recovery from hard drugs. And I would relapse because I wasn't taking care of myself. So I knew that I had to get out of it somehow. So I ended up asking my boss. I was working at the Living Room Drop-In Center. And it was a program-based me uh, mental health drop-in center. And I asked him if we could have a barbering program. I had no idea what I was doing. But I watched YouTube videos. And I bought a barbering kit. And I just started cutting people's hair. <laughs> yeah. Honestly, is that ever cool? <laughs> I, I honestly, I, as soon as I picked up the clippers and I started cutting hair, it was my second haircut. It was a suicide intervention. Yeah. And I had been working with this gentleman for quite a while. And he was going to, he told me walking by that he wanted to go gas him and his dog because they were both homeless. Mm -hmm. And I said, well, not with that haircut. And I put my arm around him and we walked into the next room and I just put my phone to the side and looked up what kind of haircut he wanted. Yeah. And it was, as soon as I put my hand on him and started cutting his hair, that's when the magic happened. It's something about a transference of physical touch and you're genuinely trying to help someone. A bridge is get, like the gap is bridged right there. Yeah. Um, a connection was made and he got emotional and mm -hmm. he got real and he got honest and he got into treatment. Like I, that from that point on, he didn't kill himself and we got him into detox and the treatment and he's still clean. Yeah. So at that moment, I didn't want to be a counselor anymore. I wanted to cut hair, but to help other people. I wanted it all in one thing, and barbering was the way I found so. Yeah, is that ever amazing? And that really leads into, so the next thing I want to ask you about was one of the goals you sort of talked about on your CDC interview that you wanted to, you know, do with Street Cuts Barber was to fight against or end stigmas that exist around homelessness, mental health, um, and addiction. Um, and you talk about because you used to be all those things, the kind of guy that people walked around. So even you Absolutely. talking about that physical touch with him and that kind of thing. But what stigmas do you think there are that currently exist um, against people suffering from those kind of things? I think I can only speak from my own personal experience and the experience I've worked with people that are experiencing that is the main stigma I find is that you don't have to be homeless to be asking for help, such as spare change, money, a haircut, whatever it may be. And I feel like 
the stigma is that as soon as someone addresses themselves as possibly without a home, addicted to drugs or mentally ill, there's this kind of image that we paint on people. Mm -hmm. So I myself, I've worked with a lot of men and a lot of people, and I am the worst that I've known my, like out of all the people I've experienced, I've hit the most bottom. I was 120 pounds. I would move gyratingly. I had a gun. I was crazy. I had a $1,000 a day cocaine addiction. I looked homeless. I acted crazy. I was one of those guys that I thought that I wouldn't make it. Mm -hmm. So if I can come out of all of that, a nine-year prison sentence, going through homelessness, addiction, sexual abuse, all these things that people use as excuses, if I dealt with my healing, which I did, something great can come out of it. And I told myself when I got out of jail that I wasn't going to let what happened to me go to waste, that mm -hmm. I needed to help people. And it's part of my amends to the people that I've hurt. I yeah. can't say I'm sorry that I stuck a gun in your face and I apologize for that. I'm, I apologize. I can't do that because that would rip mm -hmm. open their life. But if they see this interview, maybe yeah. one of my victims back in the day go, okay, you know what? You're, I don't want to see you again, but I'm glad you're doing good. Yeah. It's almost like living amends that I'm making to people because it's personal to me, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. No, for sure. Um, speaking of all the change you've undergone, say from 20 years ago to where you are now, that actually was one of the things people were most curious about. And I think a lot of that has to do with the pandemic and people feeling like they're really struggling now. But what they wanted to know is how you sort of turned it around and what was the thing that inspired hope in you? Or was there a person that inspired change or how did that process sort of start? I'll, I'll tell you, I got out of prison originally in 2001, and I served a third of my nine-year prison sentence. And when I got out of jail, I had de-evolved from a man into a monster when I was on the streets. So I went from homelessness into prison, and then all of a sudden I'm getting into a halfway house, which is a treatment center. They tricked mm -hmm. me, which is good. <laughs> and the counselors humanized me. Yeah. I would grab food from people and eat like an animal. And they're like, hey, 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 no, 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 we don't do that. Yeah. Hey, they saw me and they call me on my stuff. And I'll, I'll tell you, I have a lot of heroes. I do. I like Cameron, who's from Street Thug Barbers, is one of my heroes. My son is my number one hero. Mm -hmm. But the people that inspired me to become a counselor and to get better, one of them was Bob, who worked at 1835 Recovery Acres. It's a treatment center. And I remember, I remember acting out. And, and, and not knowing why I was so messed up. And he says, man, I make 15 bucks an hour. You know who I think about the most? You. I believe in you. Do you want to go back to, like, he just spoke to me like, uh, like he cared for once. Mm -hmm. It just kind of sparked something inside of me. And he said that don't let what happened to you go to waste. Try to help someone else with it. And kind of stuck with me. And that's why we're at where we're at, I guess. <laughs> um, yeah. My, hero, my number one hero is my son. For yeah. absolutely... I'll, I'll tell you, um, when I relapsed, I had a relapse after five years out of prison. Mm -hmm. I was working at a drop-in center, and they sent me back to prison for an entire year because I relapsed. Yeah. Now, when that happened, my son got sent to Moose Jaw. Mm -hmm. And I, when I got out, I was not doing good mentally. But he, the thought that I could be with my son again, that I could be that better person, I can be that dad, that kept me going. And now I'm here living with him full time. I, I just can't be more grateful for that, right? Yeah, honestly, it sounds like you love your son a lot. And I even, I thought that when we were messaging back and forth um, to set up the interview, that he sounds like he's really important to you. Come the most. On. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so another question I had for you. So I was doing lots of research on you, going through all your Facebook and Instagram, which if you guys haven't checked out the Street Cuts Barber Instagram, you really should. There's a lot of really inspiring photos on it um but one of the things you talked about is that you feel like anybody can make it sometimes it just takes one person to be kind to them but also that when you worked as an aftercare case manager at the mustard seed that one of the most difficult things was that not everyone did make it or a lot of people didn't so what i wanted to ask you is do you feel like as a society or as individuals there are changes we can make that are going to help these people that are suffering succeed more often? Absolutely, I think that's, uh, so I, thank you. That's a good question. I get I get messages constantly on, on, on stylists and barbers who wanna volunteer or even normal people who wanna come and help out. 
And uh, these are from all over the world. I've had Australia, Carolina, the States, you name it, right? And I, tell, I try to tell everyone the same thing. I say, yeah, what you do is you go to your local wherever that needs help, your local shelter, and you just say, hey, I'd like to volunteer my time and cut some hair. And I said, then you just pour your love and your craft into that person. Because if I, I myself cannot make a change, I can't change the world. It's too great. Mm -hmm. So what I've done is I've become, I've tried to become the change. I've chipped away the edges that have made me angry and unkind and, and, and selfish and the things I took from society. So I'm making the change to not be selfish. I'm not always kind. I'm not this beam of light. Yeah. I come from a very broken place from prison in the streets. I come from violence and I come from abuse and I come from mm -hmm. hurt and I, I have walls. But as I was working with the less fortunate, it, it broke down those walls because I had to become the person that they were looking at. It, it, it was more counterintuitive, and I got more out of it than they ever will. And what I tell people all the time is, if I'm going to make a change in the world, I have to start with my immediate circle, my family, my friends, my home, my work. Mm -hmm. I start being kind and charitable and, and loving in that area. And that's the only way I can do it. And then that will spawn off in all these other directions. Yeah. So if people want to change the world, they have to start with themselves because – a hurt heart can't really do much until it's healed. Yeah, there's this idea of you have to help or love yourself before you can sort of spread that in your community. But you can start. See, what it does is if you, if you just start, if you be like volunteer your time, and you don't have to cut hair, man. You can just grab a thing of Tim Horton's coffee, one of those big things. You can go downtown to wherever near the homeless shelter, put a thing up and be like, hey, man, you want a cup of coffee? How are you doing today? You good? Cool. You don't talk about Jesus or whatever you're into. You'd be like, hey, man, I see you. Are you okay? Here you go. It, it just starts with that. And then yeah. that person sees that and they'll ask you, what can I do to pay back? And you tell them, you just give it back to somebody else. Mm -hmm. yeah. I'll tell you one story. I, I was, I had a relapse. Okay. And I was working as a counselor and I was losing my hair during the relapse and it was gross. Mm -hmm. And I went to the dream center in Calgary. Mm -hmm. and, uh, uh, Gary Carmichael's a friend of mine who runs it. Okay. I couldn't go to a meeting. I was shaking so bad and I was so embarrassed because everyone knew I was in the field of recovery yeah. and I wasn't I, couldn't show my face and he's like well, I'm gonna get a lady to come and cut your hair for free and I was like what and so they went downstairs and they have this little salon in the bottom of the treatment center I sat in there and all I could do was look down and cry my mm -hmm. I've never cried like that and the lady was she gave me a nice haircut she colored my hair and I just couldn't stop I didn't know how to accept it I didn't know why she was being so kind to me because I didn't deserve it mm -hmm. and she kept touching me and say you know what just give it to someone else it's going to be okay. I care about you. I see you. So I went to that meeting. I got my newcomer chip. I got clean again. I got some time under my belt and I went back to work again, right? Yeah. So um, that's what she, was. she said to give it back. So here we are. Yeah. So then just keep passing on that kindness kind of thing. Yeah. Exactly. Um, one thing, so this sort of ties in with everything we've talked about even, I know I just, I think you just said um, about sort of recognizing people, right? When you see them, especially homeless individuals and things like that. But one of the things on your Facebook you had, I think it was by Rich Walters. Um, and he was arguing against this idea of let the addict die or that people that are addicts don't contribute to society. And mm -hmm. so I wanted to ask you what you think as someone who's been an addict and is in a really obvious way, contributing to society now. Um, what do you think the consequences are of isolating people from society and preventing them from allow, like, to be part of that community? Uh, well, I'll, I'll tell you from my own personal experience working in suicide intervention that it kills people, um, mm -hmm. that <clears throat> the, one of the main reasons why I, I turned to drugs, I didn't start doing drugs until I was 21, hard drugs. I was homeless for a long time before I started doing drugs. Yeah. But the minute I did cocaine, the minute, the second, it calmed me down, actually. It didn't speed me up mm -hmm. because my mental health is so erratic from the ADHD. Mm -hmm. That stimulant actually focused me. Mm -hmm. It felt normal. Yeah. Now, when, my, when a person's mental health is completely out of control and they introduce any kind of a substance, it doesn't matter what it is, and it normalizes their thinking, mm -hmm. call it what you want, addiction or not, I did not want to be in any other state other than that. And so my, my addiction progressed to $1,000 a day. 
Now, does that make me a bad person? Absolutely not. This is the problem with addiction. I'll, I'll tell you, people think it's a moral dilemma. It is not. This is, this is about healing and someone being sick. Mm-hmm. And they just need to heal. This isn't a bad trying to get good. This is a sick mm-hmm. trying to get well. And this is the message I try to tell people. Now, if, if, if it would have been, so back in the day, there was no drug court. So when going to prison, I'm facing a nine-year prison sentence for 15 armed robberies. Yes, that's, a, that's ridiculous. And I should, I should have went to prison, and I did. Mm-hmm. But ye, three years after I got out, they introduced drug court. Now, mm-hmm. drug court, if that was back in the day, I would not have went to prison. I would have spent yeah. three years inside of a strict programming on mm-hmm. the street, educating me on why I did what I did, yeah. and giving me the tools to live a pro-social, proactive society, like just be good again. Mm -hmm. So that would be my desire is to not punish the addict, but to humanize people, to humanize the addiction, to understand why it is. Because it's not the addiction, it's why the pain. Not Mm -hmm. why the addiction, it's why the pain. So we deal with the trauma first. And once that trauma is dealt with like mine, the addiction subsides. Mm Mm-hmm. Um, this wasn't one of the questions I sent you, so you can feel free to not answer and we can pass. It okay. You can ask anything you want. Like. Um, but talking about say some of the changes that have happened in prisons, are there other ones that you'd like to see that you feel like would be better for everyone or would treat people with more kindness or sort of more hope for a future for them? Well, I absolutely. And so there's, there's a couple of countries in the world that actually have um, prisons without guards, Mm -hmm. they decriminalize drugs. This is my this is my hope for Canada. This is Mm -hmm. my hope. My hope is that whoever's in charge takes a good look at drugs, narcotics, and gives it uh, and and decriminalizes it Mm -hmm. opens up the funding for more instead of prisons, which by the way, a federal inmate like me was $100,000 a yeah. year. I could build mm-hmm. centers and fund that for a long time with a hundred mm-hmm. grand. And you can yeah. put 60 to 80 people in that. No, yeah. First in prison, or you got 80 people in treatment. It's mm-hmm. perspective because the, the addict is in the motion and they're just yeah. trying to feed the beast. Once mm-hmm. they're subsided, they detox, their mind is clear, the, the addiction will subside. But they're going to continue doing it if they don't have support and knowledge of what's going on. Mm-hmm. So in my opinion, it has to be more treatment, more understanding. Instead of going to prison, we walk people through this because there's people like me. And there's millions of addicts out there who are way more skilled than me who could be way better and help way more people. Mm-hmm. That's something I want to see also. I think there's lots of stuff with prison reform that would be great, even in Canada. Um, so this has been lots of heavy topics that I've asked you about. Um, but moving to slightly lighter things. Okay. You've been running Street Cuts Barber almost three years. Great impact. What are your plans for the future? Honestly, I I really I know this is a a dull topic, but I I, I have when COVID's done, mm-hmm. uh, I can't wait to go to Vancouver and see one of my heroes, Street Thug Barbers, Cameron Sterling, who runs it. Yeah, and sure. I want to cut hair with him in Vancouver. I'm going to tell you something about Cam. Okay, so Cam, I left the living room drop-in center, and right beside the living room drop-in center, there was a park. Okay, that mm-hmm. he cuts hair. In. So now I left and he started Three Thug Barbers almost the month that I left. Now, if I would have stayed, I would have been with him cutting hair, but I had to go to Calgary. Yeah. And so this, this movement is not about me or Cam. It's about mm-hmm. everything. And like, I just, mm-hmm. my hope is I want to do a documentary with my Street Cuts Barber. I like to yeah. go around Canada. Mm-hmm. I'd like to document some really cool stories. And if I'm allowed to stay in the States and continue doing that, Mm -hmm. And I just want to promote more awareness that people who have experienced homelessness, addiction, and mental health can Mm -hmm. and do and will be awesome again. And it's just a matter of perspective, support, humanizing a person. And I'll tell you something about homeless people. They're called the invisible people for a reason, okay? Mm -hmm. Now, if you walk by someone who's asking for a change, you'll see people like not look at them, right? Mm -hmm. This is what they love. Hey, man, how's it going? Good. Mm -hmm. I don't have any spare change, but like, is like, are you, are you thirsty? Are, are you hungry? Uh, are you okay? Like, where are you staying? Yeah. And someone did that to me and they bought me a sandwich once. They bought me a coffee and they dropped me off of somewhere warm. I cried for three hours. Yeah. 
That it was better awesome. than 12 bucks dropped in. Just humanize a person. Look at them in the eye. Treat mm -hmm. them like humans. <laughs> yeah. No, I know, because they are, right? Like, it makes sense. They are. That I'll, I'll end it with this. This is good. So the reason why I said Street Cuts Barber was because I was in a toxic relationship, mm -hmm. and I was in the middle of a relapse in Vancouver, B.C. Mm -hmm. I... That was the last time I did drugs, and I, I almost killed myself mm -hmm. on a 14-story building. Yeah. And I remember climbing out the outside of it and leaning out because I, I was so embarrassed, and I couldn't take it. And I thought I heard my son's name. Mm -hmm. so, hey, Dad. So it scared me. I went back inside, and the relationship ended not well. And when I got back to Calgary, uh, a month later, I started Street Cuts Barber because I couldn't stop beating myself up, and I couldn't mm -hmm. stop bad things and the only thing my mentors taught me to do was go help someone else so i made a post on facebook i had no idea what was going to happen yeah this was all but this has all been blown up by me i didn't mean for this to happen yeah but a whole bunch of people showed up and i cut three people's hair and one of the guys was going through the exact same thing with me became homeless we hugged and it was just like one of those things i needed and i mm -hmm. i get more out of it than they ever will yeah. ever there's been times i wanted to use drugs there's been times i wanted to hurt myself there's been some times i didn't want to go on and I just went to my events and I put my head in it and I just pour my life into them and I don't know why but it just works so it's like me going to meetings it's my church it's my meetings it's it's mm. the way that I stay clean but give back so yeah are there any other messages you would like to leave people with today about what you're doing or anything like that uh, yeah I, I, I got messages this morning um, People are asking what they can do in their community. Um, I, I'm here in Moose Jaw right now, but soon we'll be in Calgary for the summer. There's many opportunities to cut hair for the less fortunate. If you're really interested and you want some tips, just shoot me a message. It's real simple. Go to your local homeless shelter or wherever and just ask if you can get some free haircuts and just start from there. It'll change your life. Well, thanks so much, Jade, for joining us today. I really, really appreciate it. I know oh, it's my pleasure. So, Thank you. Um, for those of you that tuned in later on, this is Jay or Jason Gauthier. Is that right? That's right. Yes. Um, who runs Street Cuts Barber. I'll be making sure to link his Facebook and his Instagram so you guys can go check him out if you haven't already. Uh, we have our next IGTV interview coming up with Sarah from Alberta Girl Acres, March 16th. So I'll be following up with some information on that. I hope you guys all have a really fantastic rest of your day. Go enjoy some cold weather, maybe, if you're in <laughs> Alberta or Saskatchewan. And I will see you guys again soon. Bye. Peace. Much love, guys. Bye, Jake. Bye.